Hi there, it's Lerald, and today I'm making another video about how to tank a dungeon. We spent a while thinking about how to choose the order in which we should make these videos. Do we go with the hardest dungeons, the most popular, our personal favorites? Ultimately, we decided to just go alphabetically, and what comes after A? That's right, it's B. So let's talk about Black Rook Hold. When Blizzard first announced this dungeon for Season 3, I was really, really dreading it. I hated Black Rook Hold back in Legion. And I was wrong. It is a fantastic dungeon. It also has tons of iconic voice lines that we quote back and forth to each other all the time. Here are a couple of our favorites. Ancient souls of the Black Rook, rise and join our chorus! Kurtalos, they come for you. They do. Ravencrest, you worthless husk. 10,000 years have not been kind. Now you. It's the easiest dungeon this season, and it's also very good. The bosses are simple, but pretty well made. The trash is good, and there are way fewer caster mobs in here than in all of the rest of the dungeons this season. This means that Paladin and Demon Hunter don't have the same huge advantage that they do over the other tanks. They're still the best, don't get it twisted. But the main sources of danger from trash mobs are skills that you have to cancel with hard CCs like Leg Sweep, Shockwave, Death Grip, that kind of thing. So Monk, DK, Druid, and Warrior all do really well in this dungeon. Also, whether you're doing like a plus 12 or a plus 30, the pulls in the dungeon are fairly similar. There is obviously room for making skips, doing larger pulls, and pulling trash onto bosses and higher keys, of course. But it really is a dungeon where you kind of just zone in, hold W until the end, and then you're done, and... That is great. Now for the usual disclaimer before I walk through the route, my goal is to talk about what I do to maximize the group's chances of finishing the dungeon quickly and limit the possibility for other players to make mistakes. This is not the most efficient route possible, certainly not the fastest, and that's okay. You can make changes and pull more aggressively if your group is up to it. This is just the route I recommend for leading pug groups through the dungeon smoothly. I'm not going to be upset if you make more double pulls than I have here. That's totally cool. With that being said, this route should be fine all the way from a plus two up to about a 25. And here is my MDT route for this dungeon. It's on the screen right now. I'll put a paste bin link to copy the import string into your MDT in the pinned comment. I highly recommend using MDT. It's a great add-on. Now let's talk about some of the important pulls. I like to go right at the start and do a double pull. I used to go left because the left path has more trash, so you can do one fewer pull throughout the dungeon and hit a perfect 100%, which always feels very nice and satisfying, but that's stupid and the left side is bad. It's harder, and there are two protectors of the front half of the hallway, so if you pull both of them, they will protect each other, and then the pull takes forever, and when these pulls take forever, the retainers spam a damage over time effect on the party, putting a huge amount of stress on the healer, usually people die. Also, if you miss even one mob along the way, like even the tiniest little spider, a 100% root becomes a 99.99% .99 root, so just go right. It's fine if you have to do one more pull later on, it's honestly easier and faster this way, and you'll never have to spend three minutes running backwards to kill one trash mob because you missed a single spider. And speaking of spiders, they are the most dangerous enemy in the entire dungeon for tanks. After the first boss, there is a massive pull of tiny spiders. They cast a magic debuff on the tank, it does shadow damage over time, and they will just stack it and stack it and stack it and stack it. They do this until the point where a single tick can kill you from full to dead. Now, obviously, it's just the healer's job to uh, dispel you, but using defensive cooldowns is really important. I usually open with Divine Shield here if I'm on the Paladin, or Anti-Magic Shell if I'm on a DK, or like Celestial Brew or Shield Wall, or any other huge defensive cooldown. And I do this as I am gathering the spiders up. They like to apply their debuff with the first attack, so it's important to preemptively fire that cooldown so you don't just suddenly go from full to dead in a single tick. The next pull has one big spider and a couple of little guys. He's way less dangerous than the 15 little spiders, so I just drag him upstairs. And then the next set of pulls are all very similar to each other. Your goal is to tank the Soltorn Champions or Commander Shimdasan facing a wall so that when they cast Bone Breaking Strike, it just hits the wall. Be sure you sidestep the strikes and help CC the Risen Scout's Knife Dance casts. And that's pretty much all there is to this whole main room. There is one little trick here. After you've cleared out the initial pack of mobs that are in the main room, the group can line a site behind a pillar to force the pack that jumps down and has Commander Shem Dawson in it to clump up to run toward you. You can line a site individual archers as well to force them into melee range. I'll demonstrate that with a clip here. 
Other than that, the knife dances and arrow barrages and all of that, these pulls are fairly simple, mostly just mobs that auto attack. Once you finish the second boss, the round hallway with scavengers in it is either a two pull or a three pull, depending on how secure you feel in the group and what the weekly affixes are. If there are on death effects, I wouldn't go crazy in here. You don't need a 15 bolstered scavenger one shotting the group with whirlwind. But on tyrannical weeks with no on death effects, this room is a great place to do huge pulls and go absolutely nuts. After the round hallway, you face your second staircase with rocks, and unlike the first one, which is so easy that I skipped right over it, the second one is legitimately kind of dangerous. I have seen a considerable number of people die in this staircase. If you're on a paladin giving someone in the group who's really fast, like a rogue, a bop and letting them zoom up the stairs to turn the rocks off quickly is a good idea, otherwise just walk up carefully. Some people like to do the bat gauntlet all at once, but now that they can only command four bats at a time to sick other players, I prefer to do them two at a time, two and two. So two dominators in the first half of the staircase and the other two once the first two have died. This ensures that the group will be able to actually kick all of the fell frenzy casts, and that's important because the fell frenzy buff stacks up pretty quickly and is pretty dangerous if you don't have good interrupts. You can pull all the way up on lower difficulties, or if you just feel safe doing that, it works, it's just a bit risky. In either case, once you decide to go all the way up, be sure to pull into the third boss's room as that will make the bats stop spawning. After the third boss, I like to do the guys on the stairs in two pulls. Six mobs in each pull, just don't get hit by the stuns, and that's pretty much it. They're really not very dangerous to you as a tank, just don't get stunned by the Lancer's Wraith and Stives. That is a tongue twister. I knew before I even said it, I wrote it in the script. Lancer's Ravens dies, it's gonna be tough to say. That's pretty much the entire dungeon. Now let's talk about the how Affix has changed this dungeon. I didn't really mention this in the Ataldazar video because Ataldazar is kind of a generic dungeon. None of the affixes have big interactions that impact its difficulty. I think that's mostly the same here, but there are a couple of affix overlaps. It can be a little tough in Blackrock Hold, and here they are. First off, Raging, which is usually kind of a nothing affix, winds up actually being pretty bad in the rooms with the Risen Scouts. They become immune to CC at low health, and then that means they can just hard cast knife dances unless an Evoker, Druid, Hunter, or Rogue removes the Enrage, and then someone else spends a different <laughs> GCD crowd controlling them. You can also just kill them and that is my preferred approach. I like to hit them with touch of death or execute, but this is still a mechanical overlap that absolutely will cause wipes if it's not handled well at higher levels. And Corporeal is also pretty annoying for a similar reason. It eats up a lot of crowd controls. This is a dungeon where you want to use a lot of hard CCs to cancel skills like knife dance, arrow barrage, etc. So having to hold them in order to crowd control incorporeal ads or not having them available because you used them on an incorporeal ad, that can kind of be dangerous and cause the same issue. On death effects, so bursting, bolstering, and spiteful can also be rough in the hallway full of worm tongue scavengers. They basically just mean you have to pull slower. Um, I have seen a super bolstered scavenger whirlwind through a group and basically one bang everybody except me, and that's, you know, it's not ideal. That's about it though. This is one of the less painful dungeons in terms of affix interactions. I think Ataldazar is probably the best, but this is a close second. Now let's talk about the best bloodlust points. I prefer to use bloodlust on the very first pull on fortified weeks and then chain into the second pull as quickly as possible once it's dead. On tyrannical weeks, I prefer to just lust the first boss, pretty normal stuff. I also want to lust the final boss after after the first Dreadlord's Guile on Tyrannical Weeks on higher level keys, as he is really nasty and having lust to make that fight shorter is really important. The first Dreadlord's Guile comes up really shortly after the 300% damage bonus is applied, so if you lust right when you get that damage bonus, you waste about 20 seconds of the Bloodlust, which is terrible. This means that the best place for a second lust is basically just immediately once it comes back up. Now maybe that's Commander Shimdasen on a super high level key, maybe it's the second boss, maybe it's the round room full of worm tongue scavengers, either way you would just want to get that second lust out somewhere. Now if you're absolutely zipping through the dungeon and you're not going to be able to get out three lusts at all, which definitely happens in lower keys, I would just use the second lust on the third boss and not bother trying to lust the final boss at all. The third boss is not really all that hard, but you will get a like a full value out of a lust there instead of using it and getting 15 seconds of value where you that probably is what would happen on the final boss okay now let's talk about the important trash mobs throughout the dungeon 
In the first section, ghostly protectors are not really dangerous on their own, but single targeting them when they cast Sacrifice Soul is extremely important as they massively reduce every other enemy's damage taken, uh, 75%, but they also take 250% increased damage. Single targeting them will deal more damage than continuing to AoE. And it's a good indicator of, of how your DPS are playing. You can watch them and see if they're continuing to spam AoE, you're gonna see their damage go way down when that Sacrifice Soul goes out. If they are swapping and being focused and paying attention, uh, their damage is probably gonna go up. So that's a good spot to kind of gauge right at the start of the dungeon, the quality of your DPS. I already talked about the spider pull after the first boss, but I will just reiterate here. They have killed me more this season than the entire rest of the dungeon combined. Do not underestimate how deadly they can be right at the start of the pull. They are death with hundreds of little pointy spider teeth. There's also only one pull of a bunch of little spiders, so it's just the one pull of pain and then that's it. Just to briefly reiterate about the dangerous mobs in the middle section of the dungeon as well, the Soltorn champions cast Bone Breaking Strike, so you want to face them toward the wall, let them break the wall. Commander just Shimdasen is just a named version of these guys, he doesn't have any other mechanics, just more health. The Risen Scouts cast Knife Dance, and that's the most dangerous skill in the entire dungeon, uh, to the group at least. You just cancel it by crowd controlling them. These guys are only in four pulls before the second boss, but they are the deadliest pulls on Fortified Weeks. As long as you CC the Scouts and cancel their Knife Dance casts, they don't do anything else. You just want to be sure that you don't randomly stun them either, as that'll put them on DR, and then you might not be able to stun them on their next Knife Dance. Risen Archers are not as dangerous as Risen Scouts. I see a lot of ranged players in particular freak out about them, and they're just not that deadly. Their arrow barrage can be sidestepped. It's not always as easy as I'm making it sound because they like to leap right beside a player at range and then cast arrow barrage. I think that's the reason why people kind of freak out, but you just move out of it. They may be fanning the melee group with arrows. That is a little bit more deadly, but it's just as likely that they're blasting a wall. If they are, there is no reason to CC them. They're not hurting the wall, and any time they're spending casting arrow barrage is time they're not randomly shooting your party members with arrows. Again, you can force these guys into line of sight by stepping around the corner from them. They will immediately run to you and sack back up with the rest of the group, which is a great way to get mobs back into melee range for cleave when you're not on a DK. It's kind of crazy to say that none of the trash after the second boss has interesting or dangerous mechanics, but it's kind of true. The scavengers in the round hallway after the second boss cast drink ancient potion, and for some reason the word drink is in scare quotes. I don't know what Blizzard is implying. Are they doing something else with it? Are they pouring it up their nose? It seems like they're drinking the potion, so why are the scare quotes there? It's disconcerting. But anyways, that's all I've got. Now let's talk about important interrupts. There aren't many. I emphasize focusing and kicking the ghostly counselors while picking them up in the first two pulls of the dungeon. It helps them move into melee range with the rest of the pack so that they can be cleaved down quickly. I also focus and kick the Risen Arcanist Arcane Blitz as each successful cast increases their damage by 25%, so a buffed Arcanist can one-shot your party members. There are a couple of them in the uh, trash pulls before the second boss, and they spawn during the second boss's intermissions as well. That's pretty much it for important interrupts. Now let's talk about bosses and we'll start with Amalgam of Souls. Amalgam has five abilities, but only three of them really apply to the tank. Swirling Scythe throws the scythe out where one of your allies is standing. It makes a little purple knockback circle. You should never have to deal with this, but just be aware that if you see a purple circle on the ground, it will knock you back if you try to run through it. Reap Soul is the main tank mechanic. The Amalgam slashes at you and the slash covers a huge area in the shape of a half circle. It's a very slow cast and you can easily dodge out of it, just be sure you're not dodging into the third mechanic when you do so. The third mechanic is Soul Echoes. The boss targets a player and then they get followed by little white swirlies that explode after a delay and they fear anyone who gets hit by them. You can dodge through the swirlies if you're quick, but I prefer not to. I prefer to just never get close to them because the possibility of getting feared is really, really bad. When the boss reaches 50%, it casts Call Souls. It moves to the middle of the room, spawns a bunch of ghosts, and then it just sort of waits for them to reach it. After a really long time, it's around 30 seconds, it'll cast Soul Burst, exploding and blasting the group for a massive amount of shadow damage. If any souls reach the boss, it eats them and deals 30% more damage with the Soul Burst. 
and that's stacks. Now you can stun, slow, root, and knock back the soul, so you really should use, uh, I mean, any of those that you have. Ring of Peace is valuable here, Typhoon and Ursul's Vortex are both great, Touch of Death is excellent, anything you can do to help kill the souls is really good. The point is that you want to ensure that none of the souls get eaten. Now, sometimes that happens and it, it's not necessarily the end of the world. You want to use any sort of group defensives you have available to ensure that people live through the soul burst. That's definitely true if do, souls do get through. Blessing a spell wording on the healer is important. Blessing a sacrifice on the hunter or whatever your weakest DPS is. Rally and cry, darkness, anti-magic zone. And then if you're on a monk, uh, thoughts and prayers. Now, as for tanking the boss, there isn't that much to it. I like to pull him out of the middle of the room slightly and face him toward a wall so that Reap Soul doesn't eat up all the real estate for the rest of the group. I don't pull all the way to the wall. I just pull like 10 yards or so out of the middle of the room. That leaves tons of space for the other mechanics. Beyond that, I just try to be careful every time the boss uses Soul Echoes. There is no reason for other players to run it onto you or even near you, but sometimes they do, and you should definitely be watching out for that because getting feared is really, really bad. You may immediately run toward the group and then fan everybody with a reap soul, so just always be aware of the soul echoes, face the boss away, and help with the call souls and soul burst, and that's all there is to it. Ilosana Ravencrest is up next. She really only has two abilities that affect the tank, but she has two repeating phases and some adds to pick up, so there is a little bit going on here. Both she and the next boss are really simple if you position them correctly, but they can be pretty nasty if they're not tanked in the right spots, so they're both fights where the tank plays a big role. If you set up right, this fight's gonna feel super, super simple. In Phase 1, she has three main abilities, Vengeful Shear, Brutal Glaive, and Dark Rush. Vengeful Shear is a tank strike. It does damage. Make sure you have your active mitigation skills like Shield Block or Iron Fur or Demon Spikes up to mitigate. You can use Shield Wall and so on if you feel like you need to, but the damage it deals is pretty minor. It's basically just an auto attack with a cast time and a voice line. Brutal Glaive is an ability she targets onto ranged players. She throws a weapon at them, it does physical damage, and it leaves a 30 second bleed on them. You can bop it off if you're a paladin, you can sack that person if you're a paladin. This is helpful for your healer, but that's about all the interaction you get with it as a tank. Dark Rush is the most important ability in Phase 1. She chooses three targets and dashes between them, leaving fire on the ground in all the places that she dashes. This means the targets want to stack up, and there isn't any kind of downside that punishes people for stacking close together or stacking all on one wall. It just leaves the fire there. In Phase 2, she only has one ability, but she also summons two adds. Her only ability in Phase 2 is Eye Beam, and it is extremely easy for your ranged players to deal with. Like, I kind of make a point to only talk about the tank stuff for the most part here, but this is important enough to just like say so that you can tell your range friends as well. It is extremely trivial. Stand still, jump in place when the eye beam is on you. Don't move, don't go anywhere, just jump, 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 jump. Pretend to be Mario. It does no damage. When the eye beam ends, be sure to jump out of it, but that's it. Just jump, 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 and nothing happens. Sometimes you'll see people like Hunters and Boomkins mostly panic and draw the line all over the room, and then they have nowhere to stand once the phase ends. Forget all of that. Tell them to stand still and jump, and then the room will be clean. There will be a little circle of fire where somebody's been jumping. The other mechanic in Phase 2 is that a Risen Arcanist teleports into the fight beside her slightly to the left, and after a few seconds, a soul-torn Vanguard will jump over the gate to the right. They will immediately make a beeline toward your healer. This is a two-phase fight, and the first Phase 1 lasts for about 35 seconds, the Phase 2s all last for 45 seconds, and then Phase 1s after the first Phase 2 will last for about 90 seconds. I start out by pulling the boss directly to the left side wall, and I keep her there until she casts Dark Rush. Everyone stacks onto the wall for Dark Rush just automatically, and she drops her fire on the wall. Now the rest of the room is clean. Then we move into the middle of the room, she basically just becomes a training dummy until Phase 2. As for dealing with the phase 2 adds, here's how I do it. I immediately pick up the Arcanist and kick it. I already start out to the left of the boss. Then I run to the gate and I grab the Vanguard as he's jumping down. I pick them both up, secure threat, bring them both to the boss, and then they work exactly like they did for the last few pulls as trash bobs. I point the Vanguard toward a wall, but not at the boss because the melee DPS are standing there hitting her, and I don't want them cleaved by Bone Crushing Strike. I keep kicking and stunning the Arcanist until it's dead, then I help cleave down the Vanguard. Once he's dead, I go back to hitting the boss. Once Phase 2 ends, I drag the boss toward a wall in preparation for the next Dark Rush cast. Once she does, I pull her back toward the middle of the room. 
She will cast Dark Rush multiple times during the longer phase ones, so before the next Dark Rush comes out, I like to pull her toward either the old fire or the other side wall. You can step into the old fire as a tank, it won't be too dangerous, uh, like damage wise, unless you're on a really high key or you're pretty undergeared, but you can just stack the new fire right next to the old fire as long as it's adjacent to a side wall, that's fine. The main point is just to have her near a place to drop the Dark Rush fires safely so she's not cutting through the middle of the room and not dropping them right where she's going to be in phase two. Also, don't stand in the fire unless you're dropping off a new Dark Rush. Next up is Smash Spite, and the only real mechanical overlaps in this fight are knockbacks and lines, so it's another fight where tank position can make everything really, really, really hard for the group, or really easy. Smash Spite has four main abilities to deal with, one of which I have never seen. The first ability is Hateful Charge. Hateful Charge deals a small amount of damage initially, and it knocks its targets back. It is soakable by other people than the intended target, and that's where you come in. Hateful Charge also applies a debuff that increases damage taken from Hateful Charge by 500%. It lasts a minute, and it stacks. Now, you can dodge and parry the Hateful Charge for some reason, so if you're a monk and you're tracking your dodge chance and you know you have 100%, you can soak Hateful Charges infinitely. You can do it over and over again and never take a point of damage. It is risky. If you mess up, you will die, but it is an option, and it's pretty cool. Demon Hunters and DKs can't guarantee a parry, so I, like, wouldn't try this on anything other than a monk, but you can use Demon Spikes or Dancing Rune Weapon to greatly increase your chance of not being hit by the initial hit. Earth Shaking Stomp deals some damage and knocks everyone back, that's all there is. The third most difficult ability of this fight, really the linchpin of the fight, is Fell Vomit. It is cast by the Fell Bats that fly around the outside of the room, and it causes big fire lines that cut off space in the room if it's not handled correctly. When the boss is positioned correctly and the lines are dropped correctly, it's very easy to deal with, almost a non-mechanic. A lot of that is on the tank to position the boss so that players can deal with the lines without losing boss uptime. So you're not just doing the fight and tanking the boss, you're watching the rest of the group and dealing with their mechanics as well. The final ability is Brutal Haymaker. Allegedly a smash spite, smite smash, whatever his name is, deals damage, he gains rage, and he, he hits 100 rage, he will cast Brutal Haymaker on the tank, which deals a bunch of damage and increases your damage taken by 75% for 15 seconds. Now I see that Smash Spike gains rage throughout the fight, but even on Tyrannical Weeks, I have never seen him get above 50% rage. It's rare that he even gets to 35%. I think you would need to fight him for like 7 or 8 minutes, if not longer, in order to see this cast, or you would need to do something really, really wrong, like uh, take your shield off. Again, I don't know, I've killed this guy hundreds of times and I have never seen this skill once. So, in order to keep things simple for the Fell Vomit, I start out by pulling the boss toward the right side wall. I don't want to pull him all the way to the wall, and as a general rule, I try to keep the boss not on top of the fire, because when he casts his knockback, I want him to knock players toward the fire. So not in the fire, but not far away from the fire either, because that's how you wind up with fire lines in the middle of the room. You want the fires to be along the wall, the boss to be in melee range of the fires, and the players spread out somewhere sort of in between the boss and the wall. The first mechanic you're going to deal with in the fight is Hateful Charge, and I always like to soak the first one. I try to soak them whenever I don't have the debuff already. I will soak more than one if I'm on a monk, but for other tanks I prefer not to unless I have a major defensive cooldown available. Uh, Divine Shield. It's really not that dangerous for other players to soak a charge if they aren't debuffed, so there's no reason to play the hero on this fight. When the Earth Shaking Stomp is coming, I try to position myself so that I'm going to get thrown toward a wall. Unless I'm playing a warrior, then I want to get knocked out of melee range so I can use charge and get some free rage. As a tank, you can be targeted by Fell Vomit, and that's fine. Positioning the line is relatively simple, and if you have the boss in position for the melee DPS to drop the fires, you can do that too. You just have to look at where the line is coming from. That is the direct trajectory that the fire line will follow, so if you can get it to draw a straight line across the edge of a room, that's ideal. I think the hardest part of this mechanic, and of the fight really, is that the line can be very, very hard to see. 
Now I have some footage of groups doing this mechanic really well and some footage of groups doing it poorly. I'm going to point out a couple of spots where it goes well. The first line in the fight goes on me and I'm able to drop it directly in the corner. The second one does as well from a different direction, but I drop it in the adjacent corner. The third line goes on the rogue and I immediately pull the boss toward the spot where he needs to be to drop his line so he can move there without losing up time on the boss. The fourth line goes on Akusa and she drops it very cleanly in the space left between the first and third lines. I then get the fifth, sixth, and eighth lines because this boss sucks. <laughs> At this point, I want to try to not cut the room in half. I want to drop on top of old or near old fires, and I mainly want to make sure the boss isn't being pulled out of range of any DPS. I want the DPS to be able to attack the boss the entire fight. Now, sometimes the situation will be a lot less clean than this. Things will start to fall apart. That's okay. In that case, what you want to do is try and get the boss into the biggest safe space available that is preferably near a wall, as that will help ensure that you don't get knocked all over the place by the earth shaking stomp, you just get knocked into a wall. Then you just keep helping soak the hateful charges and try your best to line up fell vomit lines so that they overlap with existing fires. Things may be a little messy, but you can clean them up with some good line overlaps and by making a move to get the boss out of a bad corner. The last boss is Dantalian Axe who we call Dandelion X. This is another two phase fight. He doesn't really have any tank mechanics outside of the first phase, but you can still make the fight much easier for your party with good positioning. The main mechanic of this fight is your camera. The room absolutely sucks. It is the worst designed encounter space I have ever seen. Now, once you've accepted that you're basically just not gonna be able to see anything that's happening in this fight, it's not that bad. There are two main pain points, the end of the first phase and the first Shadow Bolt volley in the second phase. Naturally, we'll start with phase one. In phase one, you fight Kurtalis Ravencrest and he only has two abilities. Unerring Shear does damage to you and applies a bleed. The bleed stacks and it doesn't have a duration. It just lasts forever unless you can use Divine Shield or Blessing of Protection. So if you're a Paladin or you have a Paladin in the group, you're in luck. If not, you have to deal with that damage the entire fight, so you have a big incentive to end this phase very quickly. Whirling Blade is the other mechanic, and Kurtalis throws out a Whirling Blade that boomerangs back and forth between where he was and where the player he targeted was when he finished the cast. It does a lot of damage, and it knocks back anyone it hits. As soon as he finishes the cast, move him away so that the melee don't get cleaved by it. If the cast is on you, which it can be, you can point it right next to the wall where he's standing and it'll occupy a very small amount of space. If it's on someone else, maybe they'll do that. And if so, good. If they make it run across the entire room, oh well, don't stand there. Latosius will occasionally cast big purple death beams across the room and you just want to move out of them as soon as he does. Do not let these hit you. They deal millions of damage. Be ready to move immediately. Spoiler alert for Phase 2. In Phase 2, Latosius turns into Dandelion X and betrays Ravencrest, that worthless husk, and now you fight him directly. He doesn't have any direct tank mechanics, so you can just solo him if you have to. It's pretty annoying, but it is doable. I've done it. It was slow, but it got the job done. After about 10 seconds into Phase 2, Ravencrest will buff the group, increasing everyone's damage, healing, and health by 300%. Dandelion X's first and most dangerous ability is Shadow Bolt Volley, and he casts the first one before Ravencrest's buff goes out. This is by far the most dangerous part of the fight, maybe the most dangerous part of the whole dungeon for the group. Just like with the first boss's Soul Burst, you should use any kind of defensive group utility you have to cover up this mechanic. We're talking Rallying Cry, Darkness, Anti-Magic Shell, Spell Warding the Healer and Sacrificing the Weakest DPS. If you're on a Monk, get in a time machine back to when they had Avert Harm like 11 years ago. The Shadow Bolt Volley also applies a dot, so any off healing you can provide is really helpful. Bear Druid is actually pretty useful here. If you're on a tank that can't do anything to help, at least use your defensive cooldowns to reduce the amount of attention that the healer needs to place on you. Cloud of Hypnosis spawns a green pool. It slightly moves around a bit, and anyone who walks into it will be put to sleep. Now, obviously just don't touch it, but that can be a bit tricky later on when you're dodging the Dreadlord's Guile. 
As for positioning the boss, I always try to pull him away from the clouds by at least a few yards because they move around slightly. Now you don't have a ton of room in this boss arena, but a couple of yards away from those pools is enough. I just don't want people to have to focus on dodging them when they should be focusing on killing the boss. Stinging Swarm applies an attackable swarm of bugs to an ally. It stuns them for half a second, and it does that over and over and over and over and over again with no DR. It is very annoying. And if you wind up having to solo the boss, this will be a frustrating mechanic that he's going to cast on you. It's your main damage target while it's up, so be sure that the person who has it on them is within cleave range of the boss. If it's on a melee, that's pretty easy. If it's on a ranged and they don't move directly to the boss, move him toward them and help focus that swarm of bugs down. Dreadlord Skyle is his final mechanic. He will cast it, then disappear and spawn big purple lines like in phase one. Instead of spawning just one line, he will spawn them over and over in a formation that forces you to run around the room in a complete circle. Dodging the first line is the most dangerous part, but the clouds of hypnosis can get in the way while walking around the room. As the tank, I feel like the first purple line almost always goes on me, so as soon as he finishes his Dreadlord Skyle cast, I run to the outside of the room and I get ready to make a big move out of multiple purple lines. Then I just calmly walk around the room until he respawns. So as for the actual mechanics of tanking the fight, I like to start out by pulling Ravencrest toward the back wall of the room as being toward a side of the room makes dodging Latosius' big purple lines a lot easier. I drag the boss away from the whirling blades and I dodge the purple lines, but the rest of phase one is just a tank and spank with damage that ramps up over time. Once Ravencrest casts his buff early in phase two, the phase one bleed, pretty much stops being dangerous at all, but during the intermission when there's nothing to hit to generate rage or cast death strike on, it can be a little spicy. On Pally, it's very easy. You just divine shield the bleed off at the start of phase two. In phase two, do whatever you can to help the healer with the first shadow bolt volley and try to keep the boss away from clouds of hypnosis and on top of players who have the stinging swarm on them. Again, if you can help with healing, that's great. But if not, at least try to mitigate as much damage as you can so the healer can focus on maintaining the group's health through the Shadow Bolt Volley debuff. And that's pretty much the entire fight. It should be a lot more stressful for your healer than it is for you. So anything you can do to make things easier for them and for the rest of the group will greatly improve everyone's chances of success. And that's Black Rook Hold. It's a great dungeon, I really like it, and I think I've said enough. Alright, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye.